I guess the question is, am I through my drink already? <laughs> I've been waiting this whole time to do this. So you've got cider. I do. This is cider that I was supposed to be drinking at your place the past couple of weekends. Yeah. Trying to find schedule that works for everybody is really tough, man, when you're grown up and you have responsibilities and shit. Yeah, the timing of that whole thing just kind of worked out. I mean, I don't want to say it was bad, right? Because whatever, shit happens. Um, I talked to you earlier and I was asking, hey, what was the name of that beer? Because you gave me a name of something in Discord. I couldn't remember the name, and I looked in Discord, and you must have deleted it. I didn't, but it's definitely missing. Unless you maybe sent it somewhere else. But anyway, I was messaging you from the liquor store saying, what do you want? And you're like, oh, whatever. Cindy got it for me. And I'm like, do you have any other requests? And then I didn't hear you while I was at the liquor store. So I bought like a big box full of alcohol. Oh. Because, <laughs> you know, it was going to be your birthday weekend. Cindy asked me to pick up some adult tasty treats. Yes. And they're now sitting in my fridge. Um, I've cracked into a couple of them myself. Summer's Bee Surprise, that's the thing I drink most here. But it is awaiting our planned, rescheduled, maybe it'll happen in May, belated birthday party-ish. Maybe it'll be your 51st by the time we, we oh, get there. I really hope it isn't that long. But at this point, we're looking in June. Um, cause we had to, we were actually going to be down there this weekend, uh, to pick up Cindy's fish and to visit my parents. Cause my dad's birthday is actually the day before mine. Uh, so we were planning on making a trip down, you know, visiting with them, picking up the fish. And we had to postpone that because I, whatever Cindy had, I caught. And I mean, it was, I felt like I was dying. It was awful. And I'm mostly recovered now. There's still a little bit of a frog in my throat. I still have a tiny little bit of a cough. I'm still a little bit tired. Um, but Cindy's just like, she gets a little better and then she gets worse again. Gets a little better and then gets worse again. So we had to postpone that. So now we're doing that Mother's Day weekend. Um, and then I think the weekend after that, because uh, that's the 10th. And then the 17th, we were going to do it. But my friend from up here is occupied that weekend. And then the following weekend, you guys can't come. And then that's basically the end of May. So I think that we're looking at doing it in June, which, um, you know, good news. You have lots of time to prepare whatever you want. Bad news. My birthday is going to be like two months late. We'll be celebrating my birthday at Cindy's birthday party. Hey, you got to look on the bright side. There's a better than 50% chance that you won't have snow. Yes. Yeah, because it snowed this week. Um, for, for those of you who are listening to this on a time delay, that's, um, nearly the end of April. It is now April 26th. Um, and two days ago we had snow that not only fell out of the sky, but stayed on the ground for a whole day, which is, this is actually pretty late for that to happen up here. Typically around the, the middle of April, we'll get sort of like snow will fall, but it doesn't stay on the ground. The latest I've ever seen it happen, I think is the second week of May where you get like just a, a couple of flakes that fall and that's it, right? You get a day mm -hmm. where it's like two or three degrees above freezing. But I mean, it's been like most days it's in the, in the sort of low teens Celsius. And like there's been a couple of days, so it's been over 20. Yeah. Yeah. It got up to close to 20 here today. It's supposed to be pretty high all weekend, although we're going to get a little bit wet. Listen to us talking about the weather on a podcast. I'm sure people are absolutely riveted. All of the Canadian listeners will be like, yeah, this is the podcast that I want to tune into because that's what we do. The question about pushing your thing into June is, are we going to miss that three day window between snow and black fly season? No, absolutely not. Mosquitoes are already coming out. I've been bitten twice. Yeah. So no, there, there will definitely be black flies. Now on the plus side, we do actually have a screen room on the deck on the back so we can, you know, hang out without getting bitten. We can have a fire. Would have been too cold for that. Uh, last weekend, for sure. Mm -hmm. It'll happen at some point. Whenever it happens, I'm looking forward to getting up there. I haven't been to the area since you took me up. Oh, my God. For somebody else's outdoor party. I think there was poker involved. 
Yeah, that was in February of like last century. It had to be what, 2002, 2003? It was around there because we had we had just barely met. Well, I say just barely met, you know, with the 24 years of of knowing each other that we've uh, that we've had now. We were established friends at that point, but it was probably before the uh, Grundy Lake camp adventure. It absolutely was. Yeah. But you were still working at stream at that point. I don't even I think that you were still on the floor at stream at that point. So it was early in your career. Mm. Well, on the floor, mentor, whatever. You weren't uh, at your lofty training position yet. <laughs> so what are you drinking, man? Uh, I have another beer that was picked out based on its color called Abbott, which is, uh, according to the label, a rich and multi premium ale. It's actually quite good. Can was purple. I was attracted to it. I tried it. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is not my first drink of the day. We had uh -oh. a uh, staff lunch. Now that we've fully transitioned to remote, I mean, we're still a small team. You know, rather than spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on lease and utilities, like once a month or so, we want to try and at least get a little bit of FaceTime, shut down early on a Friday, meet for lunch in person, and then call it a day. So um, I had uh, a couple pints and some wings over at Slap Shots. Slap Shots is still open? Slap Shots is still open. It hasn't changed in like 40 years. No, I was going to say, it's got to be very close to the longest open, continuously open restaurant in the Quinney area. Mm -hmm. It's getting up there and it is still decent, still busy, you know, still has that lunch crowd of trades people that park their vehicles that have like, you know, company names and signage on them in the back to hide the fact that they're there drinking uh -huh. while on the job. Just pack in for that window between like noon and one and then completely disappear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. Ah, it's also not my first drink of the day. I did actually put some uh, butterscotch ripple schnapps in my coffee earlier today. I wasn't sure if it was a good idea, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to try this before we record just in case it knocks me flat on my ass. And it didn't. So good enough. So you didn't go golfing? I did not go golfing. Uh, part of the reason was is that I've been out to hit balls a couple of times this week. Um, and after nine months of not doing that, some of those muscles are complaining a bit. So day of rest is not a bad idea because I am 50 now. And also I have a, a tea time with a friend tomorrow afternoon. So I thought I'm not going to do it two days in a row. Not at the beginning of the year anyway. <laughs> Ease into it. Yeah, well, I, I, cause I walk, right? I don't take a cart. So, you know, and typically I play 18 holes, which is what, like two or three miles of walking, which is an awful lot to do two days in a row at the beginning of the season when I've literally not been out of my chair in nine months. That was the other nice thing about getting out today was that I'm having a hard time finding excuses to get out doing anything really now. Um, at one point in this past couple of weeks of working home, full time. It was six days before I actually like stepped out of the house at one point. I mean, I let the dog in and out. I probably was in the yard briefly, but to get out past the gate and actually touch grass, smell the fresh air, it was like six days. Now that the weather's coming, it'll be easy to get the dog out for walks on the regular and stuff. It's tough. I mean, I made sort of a promise to myself uh, last fall that I was just, cause I, I, there's a walking trail, literally like my next door neighbor across the street, there's walking trails that go for 50 miles. And I thought to myself, Hey, it's right there. I'll just, you know, I'll throw on my snowshoes in the winter and I'll go walk every day. Never happened. So I want to try and do that, you know, some more, but yeah, you know, you're 50 years old, your legs will turn black and die. Right. Yeah, or something. <laughs> Either that or, you know, somebody will mistake me for an old person that got left out on the ice flow and, you know, just make sure and club me like a seal. Anyway, exercise is hard and I'm lazy and I own it. It's me. The problem is me. I understand that. But like many problems where the solution is simple, it's still not easy. Anyway, we have a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. 
you did put a couple of things in the dog. I'm actually excited for one of the topics. Um, I did the most dude thing and I let my mind roll with that topic just to like think about things that I would remember. And I built a list. Oh, fantastic. Because my list includes exactly one thing and it's already there in front of you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But before we get to that, uh, you have a note here about Indiana Jones. I assume the new movie. Just Indiana Jones, the character. If you think about like, Indiana Jones in the classroom, and I'm, I'm, to whoever wrote the post on Reddit, I'm sorry, I am completely and utterly stealing your idea. Uh, once again, I wasn't able to favorite the post. I would like to read the whole thing to you because it was brilliant. But the, the, if you look at the difference between Indiana Jones in the classroom and who, who he is as a teacher, right? He, he fumbles and stumbles and stutters and he doesn't, doesn't speak well. He doesn't have a great deal of confidence. And then he goes to like, you know, pick up a, an artifact or whatever. And he turns into this gun toting, whip snapping, you know, super confident con man. Who's, I've come to look at the tapestries. This is a castle, isn't it? You do have tapestries. Um, it was describing like the idea that what if Indiana Jones took his students on a field trip, right? These are, these are kids who are taking an archaeology class and everybody knows that. I mean, the real world of archaeology is is that you go somewhere and you spend hours and hours and hours painstakingly unearthing things, cataloging them, analyzing them, looking at them under microscopes, doing carbon dating, making lists, making databases, right? Having long, arduous discussions about what is this and what does it mean, right? So they're, they, they bring along, you know, their straw hat. At least now that archaeology has become a sane discipline of science. I mean, it's sort of early colonial years. Like, No, 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 no. I'm talking about modern, the, the, the actual idea of archaeology and how we conceive of it now versus when it was. It's a race to see who can build the most ridiculous skeleton and sell it to some nobleman somewhere. I'm going to dig up the ancient city of Troy. Which one? The one from the book. How are you going to do it? Dynamite. Yeah. Also, we're going to shoot up the Sphinx's face. <laughs> but imagine him taking his students and they're expecting, OK, I've brought my, my little shovel and have brought my little brush and, and we're going to like dig a square centimeter of earth every day. And it's like we're running away from boulders and we're destroying civilizations in the jungles of South America, you know, and we're fighting Nazis. It's like, who are you? And the premise was um, that. Indiana Jones is the exact mirror image opposite of Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus, right? Where you expect sort of, or you, you go on the, the Magic School Bus and it's all of these wonderful things happen. You learn all of these things. Um, but if you go with Indiana Jones, you just end up killing stuff and destroying things. Anyway, I thought it was an interesting idea and I was curious to get your take on it. Well, I think you touched on something that we, we can't let go, first of all. Why, oh, why did we get Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and whatever the fuck the last one was called? Dial of Destiny, I think. The last one was actually an Indiana Jones movie. Uh, Yeah, except Indiana Jones wasn't Indiana Jones. But anyway, uh, why didn't we get Indiana Jones as a teacher taking his kids out on a field trip? Because that would have been a fucking awesome movie. That would have been an excellent movie instead of Dial of Destiny. I agree. The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull did not actually happen. That was something that we can put into the... um, Mass hallucination pile, yeah. We'll put that right into the Mandela effect. It never happened. So, yeah. Here's the thing. Like, I didn't... We need to talk about Dial of Destiny now. Um, I assume you've seen it. I have. I didn't mind it. Uh, it was too long. There were too many car chases in it. Um, they were they worked really too hard at trying to make Indiana Jones an action hero again. And Harrison Ford is what now? 90? 92? 97? I don't know. 105? Old. My take on the movie, I think, is the opposite of most takes that I've read. Most takes that I've read focus on that early section of the movie where he's de talking about how it went on too long and blah, blah, blah. And they could have done without it. And I'm, to me, that was the best part of the movie. I enjoyed that. I would have watched that movie to its conclusion 
versus what we got for the second big portion of the movie, where Indy got to be bumbly. I was totally okay with that. I was 100% on board with Indiana Jones is now an old man. He's retired and he doesn't know what to do with himself. Let's explore that. We've seen the Indiana Jones adventure movie. Let's let's do that with a younger actor for the next one or whatever. Let's let's see Indiana Jones at the sunset of his life and how he deals with that. The fact that they tried to turn his retirement into an action movie is what I have an objection to. Yeah, and and I don't disagree with that, but I think like the the characterization step away from Indy for a second and talk about Ant-Man, because, you know, nobody takes Ant-Man personally. I do. I love Ant-Man. The first Ant-Man movie, they set up this character, Scott, played by Paul Rudd. He was an interesting character because he wasn't an idiot. He was a smart guy. He was a clever guy that just happened to get himself into trouble a lot, right? But he was yes. like, this is a guy that, you know, I mean, I forget what school he went to, but like he was a technical, smart dude, intelligent, awkward, yes. charming. But yes, if you look at all the rest of the Ant-Man movies, they just wrote him as an idiot. Yes, agreed. And I hated that. I dislike it. I understand why they did it, though, because they have to give because there's other characters in there, right? Like there's his love interest, the Wasp. Um, there's. What's his face? Who's also 90 million years old and they have to give him parts. And then his wife who honest to God, if he married her when he was 20, he would have been a pedophile because she's like 40 years younger than he is. I mean, she wasn't even born yet when he was 20. Like, let's be honest <laughs> like that. That trope in Hollywood needs to stop. Like 90 year old sure. men should not be dating like 40 year old women. Most or at least it shouldn't be like the norm. All of that aside, I understand why they did it with Ant-Man, but I do agree with you. I would, however, like to, and I cannot remember the actor's name for the life of me, but the guy who does the summaries of... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let me tell you what happened. That guy is missing in the latest movie. Hugely. I would I would literally watch... I want... you know. Do you remember... Uh, this is getting into our next topic, but do you remember Movies in 30 Seconds by Bunnies? I don't. You don't? Oh my God. I, I could have sworn I, I shared that with you, but there's a, I think it still exists, a website called Movies in 30 Seconds by Bunnies. And they literally, they make animated bunnies and they do funny voices and they do the whole of a movie in 30 seconds. They've done Aliens. They did Jaws. They did, I would watch, Michael Sena, I think is his name. Is that, is that right? Pena. Pena. Yes. Yep. Um, I would watch. If, if he did a thing on YouTube or somewhere where he literally just took the plot of a movie and did it in 60 seconds as that character, I, I would, I would sign up for his only fans for that because he, he was great and he made those movies. No, mm -hmm. oh, I agree. Uh, now getting back to Indy, I felt the way I felt about Ant-Man, that entire last Indy movie. Nothing exemplified it more. I mean, A, the fact that they just had him tied up for the, the finale, right? Like, he didn't get a chance to be Indy. That that was a weird decision for me. But even that scene where he's in that, like, that gambling club when they get to wherever it was they were, and they do the reverse whip gun thing. Oh, yeah. I vaguely remember that, yeah. Yeah, where he's at the, the head of the table and he's, he's whipping things around, then everybody pulls out their gun. Like, I don't care how old he is. Like, and you wouldn't do that. You're pretending I didn't see the other movies. That's, this is one of those things where, like, if you take Indy out of that movie, it's not a good movie. But if you take Indy out of that movie and don't try and make it an Indiana Jones movie, it could be a good movie. Possibly. I didn't have much that I cared for about both the writing and acting of the, the female protagonist, I forget her name. I haven't seen it since it was in theaters, but I found... The writing was convoluted. There were too many twists. Yeah, but I just, I, I mean, I found her annoying, honestly. Um, I don't really? think it was her as an actress. I think it was mostly the way they were writing her. It's just one of those things where you're trying to make me like a character that is just objectively unlikable and mostly has no redeeming qualities about her. And I'm not going to yeah. retroactively like the last two hours of my life that I feel I've wasted just because you give her a nice moment at the end or something, right? 
And that's another trope that we really need to do away with. Like you can you can have an anti-hero that you give a shit about. You yes. know, you can have a character that is not supposed to be a good human being necessarily, but for the audience, make them likable or charming or, or something to allow you to enjoy the time you're spending with them on screen. And I just, and it wasn't just me. I know Tanya felt the same way. Didn't like her at all. Didn't like the character at all. Didn't like the the role she was filling in the movie at all. I preferred Shia LaBeouf in that movie that didn't happen. Yeah. I, I actually quite liked the Mutt character. Yeah, not really a big fan of Shia LaBeouf, but I mean, the, the character was fine. And the, the role that he played in the movie was good. Until they got him swinging in trees with monkeys. And then it was just like, oh, man. Yes. You've really nuked the fridge on this one. <laughs> uh, I can't wait until nuking the fridge jumps the shark. <laughs> yeah, that that. Oh, my God. What was it? Um, it the uh, have you watched any of the Fallout TV show? I haven't yet. It's on my list of things to hopefully get into this weekend. I've heard it's quite good. We watched episode one and it is quite good. It, it's it's a very different. It captures the the feeling of the original Fallout games really well. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't played any of the later ones. I mean, I did a little of Fallout one, a little of Fallout two. Um, and that was pretty much where I stopped. But the sort of vibe that you get from them, they capture that really well. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the actors that they chose are fantastic and they do a great job. I, you know how most series, like you watch episode one or the pilot, and you think this has potential. If they, if they get their legs under them and they figure out what they're doing, this will probably be okay. Mm -hmm. This is one of those ones where it's like, I watched episode one and I'm like, they nailed it. It feels like we're starting episode one of season two. That's how gelled everything is. Yeah. It's pretty crazy that, you know, we're getting that with some shows that are about video games now. You know? Yeah. Now, in the case of The Last of Us, I think, hey, they, they did some amazing things with the show. And they did take some creative risks that really paid off in some of the episodes. But it was pretty wise to stick to the formula from the game, right? Because the games essentially were a movie anyway pretty much you yeah. know so there's entire scenes that are lifted right out of the games that were basically reshot live action and they went out of their way to not try and do it differently not try to and of course the guy behind the games um studio head producer was involved in, in the shows so stands to reason that that's kind of the way it went and where he did deviate with uh from the formula from the games turn out to be some of the more amazing episodes it's well it's important to because it's a different medium right so you have to change things up a little bit mm -hmm. like there's things you can do in the live action you can't do in a video game and vice versa uh it's one of the things have you have you looked at the i know that you're not a big fan of the robert jordan wheel of time stuff but you're familiar with the arc of the story yes uh have you paid attention to the tv show at all i did not i looked at it and i said you know what nope you can skip it it's one of the, the the most succinct analyses of that show that I have seen is summed up as follows, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that if you have a body of lore and a story and characters that are really well loved by its audience and by their fans, when you make an adaptation of it, it doesn't make any sense to try and do something completely different. If you want to do something completely different, do something completely different. If you are going to base something on an existing story, be faithful to the spirit of the story. Because mm -hmm. they literally like threw everything out the window from episode one. And it was really like as a fan of the books, because I really do enjoy that story um, in that world. The, the t I stopped watching the TV show after three or four episodes. It was just like, this is this is shit. The only thing that they got right um, was I honestly believe in their choice of actors for the Moraine character and for the Rand character, right? I think they did a good job. I think their sets were pretty good, right? Filming on location in wherever in Northern Europe they did. Great. Fantastic. Everything else, utter shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt that way. Like, 
and you know, you're not supposed to judge a book by the cover and you shouldn't judge a show by the trailers, but the trailers were enough to convince me that I didn't want to watch that. And I didn't watch the Lord of the Rings TV series. They recently did either. I quite like that one. Yeah. Mostly because I, it, most of the complaints that I've heard about that show are juvenile. Mm-hmm. Right. Like she's a thousand years old. Why is she acting so immature? Well, because, you know, her species lives literally forever. A thousand years old is actually pretty young, comparatively speaking. Mm-hmm. Right? Like she is one of the younger generation. So, of course, she's a little bit immature. Right? Because nobody expects her to, to do any better. I mean, I thought they chose a great actress for that role. Uh, I enjoyed the stories. I think it hit all the right notes for me. I do understand that people don't like it. And I like there's a few that I've... A few complaints that I've heard where I've gone, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. I disagree, but I understand yeah. your point. I don't know. It's it's a tough line to walk. And it's a challenge that I don't, you know, envy the people that have made an attempt and failed at. When you have a beloved IP, right? It's a binary choice. You're either going to absolutely hit it out of the park or you're going to fall flat on your face. Mm-hmm. My inclination would be, and, and you know, I'm going to put my headspace in the, the showrunners and stuff for this show, and, and, and they tried to do it sort of, don't make a Lord of the Rings show, right? Okay, we just had some amazing movies and the books are great. How could you compete with either one of us? They just had some movies like 20 years ago. That's, that is disturbing to think about. They were great movies, you know, not perfect, but, but very, very good. Better than they had any right to be. Given yes. what the bar was for high fantasy at the time in, in sort of a theatrical cinematic um, setup. But... Crow. <laughs> <laughs> Masters of the universe. Oh, my God. Oh, my actual God. <laughs> so, you know, if I were taking on that challenge, part of me would be like, look, I'm not going to make Lord of the Rings. I'm probably not going to make The Hobbit. Can I do a Middle Earth story? Take everything that I want from the setting that people can identify with. Let me attach the Lord of the Rings to the title of it in a way that helps draw people in, but not create something that is going to be under such a microscope. And of course, the challenge with that is, but I wanted Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, though, is that if you do that and you do it well, you end up with Knights of the Old Republic, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Right, the game, not not any TV show or cartoon. So much of the, I mean, Star Wars is a really good example of that because, like, the Star Wars, the original trilogy, of course, is beloved by us and people of our age, and kind of poo pooed by the the kids. I, I say kids, you know, people who are now entering their forties, uh, because they grew up with the prequels, right? Which they loved because, of course, they were targeted at this is for kids, right? So, of course, people who were kids when the original trilogy came out and now have this gigantic body of lore, which is all kinds of books and, and cartoon series and, and various spin off movies that nobody's ever watched. You know, like all of those things did so, did that kind of thing successfully. Like, here are those characters that you love in a different time and a different story, or here are stories of people that are tangential to those characters in that universe. And, you know, you see Coruscant and you see Tatooine. You see Hawk and you see Corellia and you see all of the ships and you see TIE fighters and blah, blah, blah. All of those member berries are in there with a story that, that fits right. Like that. I don't, do you know how many um, novels were basically shuffled to the side as legends when Disney took over? It was thousands. Oh, the expanded universe was massive, man. And most of it was, contradictory and it was a big mess because at the time well, of you know, course. LucasArts didn't didn't particularly care. They're like, you want to do something? Go do it. It's Star Wars. And that is what makes a compelling story is mm-hmm. well, okay, these two things are contradictory. Which one do you believe? And that that brings the the consumer of that media in. Right. Where, because you, you now have to think about it instead of just, oh, well, this is obviously, yeah, they, they chose, you know, X, Y, and Z from the spreadsheet. Sure. And I think in books, it's easy, right? Yes. 
the Timothy Zahn stuff. Like, it's all quite fantastic. I think, you know, we've obviously burnt out on the, the mainline Skywalker saga stuff. So they've taken gambles and we're going to do all of this other stuff. So, you know, for every Mandalorian season one, which people really like, you run into Mandalorian season three or the Book of Boba Fett that people are like, eh. Or an Ahsoka where everybody's like, you know what? This is going to be good in a couple of seasons. I I actually enjoyed season one of Ahsoka. I did too. I, I mean, I thought it had some dead spots. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. You look at it, though, and you're like, oh, so to summarize the season, what happened? Well, you know, they eventually went to a place and then immediately some of them came home. What did they do while they were there? Oh, nothing. They just they got there and the season ended. I'm fine with it. I'm totally fine with it. But I get why people were, you know, why it didn't resonate with everybody. Sure. And that's going to happen. I, that's that's one of the things, though, that I think is important about that series is that it didn't resonate with everybody. Well, and it was very much, you know, it was a, it was the final season of uh, animated show. Right. And the people that watched the animated show, no doubt, loved the shit out of that first series of Ahsoka. Um, well, I've never seen the animated show, so. No, but, you know, you're odd. You don't count. Yes. I am definitely odd. I, one of the things is, is that I just, I just love Rosario. You like the new movie. Indiana Jones movie. I thought it was okay. Like I say, like the, the, the tuck, tuck chase car chase went on way too long. Which one? Wasn't there like four of them? Yeah. All of them. Basically cut all of them. It, here's okay. You want a succinct summary of what I think about that Indiana Jones movie? Watch the red letter meter review. And I agree with Rich on everything. Everything he said about that movie, I agree with, hundred percent. It it disturbs me how often that's the case. <laughs> Speaking of red letter media, I was disappointed by the most recent Neil Breen episode. Not in the red letter media, people. I'm disappointed, in Neil Breen. I I here's here's the thing. Neil Breen is making money doing this. I appreciate Neil Breen because he has set the bar so low. <laughs> Such that I, this is actually something I was going to bring up later, but I'll bring it up now. I actually kind of want to make a movie. I want to make a movie and I want to try and make the quality lower than a Neil Breen movie. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a stretch goal, but, uh, I think, I think I can, and I have an idea that I will, I will run by you, uh, later. I would like to actually start, uh, doing something in November. So, uh, is it cracked? I can't remember which. It was one of the old YouTube channels that I really loved that disappeared for like five years after it was bought out several times and driven into the ground. And then somebody tried to resuscitate it, and sort of bring it back. But anyway, it's one of them. It wasn't the college humor guys. I'm pretty sure it was a cracked ones. They do a series where they try and recreate movies. It's probably similar to your bunny thing, but they try and do it on a budget of like 20 bucks sort of thing. That's That's the whole shtick. And they have just like cut out paper costumes and stuff like that, that they put on and, and, and recreate scenes from the movie. It's kind of fun. That would be fun. And that's, I, I, I have an idea for an original story that I want to do. I don't like, I don't know how practical it is and it's, it's not fully gelled in my brain either. Like I don't have anything other than here's a premise, right? I have an elevator pitch and that's all I got. So it might, I mean, it might go nowhere. We'll see. I don't know. You might be interested in it. You might not. It's funny. I had some uh, similar idea the past couple of days. Um, I've started rewatching uh, season one of The Expanse. I know you haven't watched it yet. I've recommended it before. I've been looking for something to watch when Tanya's like not home, where I just I have an hour to kill. I don't have any new pods to listen to. I'm just going to sit down on the couch with the dog and, and throw something on that she's not going to be upset with me that I'm, you know, watching something without her because we have the few shows that we're currently watching together. Well, hold up, though. You run out of pods to listen to? I'm still trying to catch up on the backlog of some stuff. that You mentioned Crack. Uh, Robert Evans, uh, the guy who does Behind the Bastards, actually originally worked for Crack before it got shut down. Mm -hmm. Some of his guests are our previous producers as well, but I'm, I'm listening to stuff that has like a backlog of 1600 episodes. Do you just like not listen to the backlog or do you just, I listen to a, to a lot stuff? of the backlog stuff, but I mean, I've been listening to podcasts pretty steady for 20 years now or however long they've been a thing since oh, 2006, okay. 2007 ish. So 
So I don't, you know, I don't listen to a lot of news shows, um, which, uh, funny enough, I'm going to plug a new show today in our parting gifts. It's not a new show. It's just one I haven't listened to yet. It is one that I'm going through the backlog on now. Pods are sort of the, the thing I throw on when I'm doing shopping or I'm in the kitchen cooking or washing dishes, stuff like that, or I'm out for a walk. You know, sometimes you just want to throw yourself down on the couch and watch something and kind of only half pay attention to it or whatever. And, and that's sort of what I'm doing when I rewatch a lot of these old shows. Anyway, going back to The Expanse, in watching it, I thought one of the things that I would like to do is make a sci-fi show for YouTube. Where you, you know, I've been doing my craft shit, right? Where I like make actual spaceships and stuff, badly crafts. And then you reenact a show almost like a puppet show where okay. you see things that are happening, but it's literally you with your hands holding up these spaceships doing stuff. Your hands are on screen at the same time. Amazon Women on the Moon or Plan 9 from Outer Space, where you, the ship goes across and it's, you could literally see the wire that it's dangling from. No, dude, we don't have the budget for wires. Hands. <laughs> like literally like a puppet show. But you're holding spaceships and you're doing stuff with it. And then cut to a scene of, you know, something else. Again, it's just holding up pieces of cardboard and stuff on the set of a, you know, uh, like a, a starship or whatever it is, whatever kind of sci-fi you want to do. But again, it's just, you know, here's a cardboard wall. I'm behind it or whoever's doing it is behind it, moving things up like this. and. That's a great idea. Let's do it. I'm I'm on board. But like, play it straight. Oh yeah, yeah. Like C Lab 2020. <laughs> did 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 you watch C Lab 2020 at all? Back when it was, I mean, this was in 2004 or something. Um, so C Lab 2020 was actually a cartoon that was released in the 70s or 80s, I think. And it was a serious cartoon with people living under the sea in a lab, like solving problems and doing things mm -hmm. i've heard of it i don't think that i've ever watched it it's worth a watch um they, they they do basically what they do is they somebody got the rights to the old episodes and they cut the audio out and redubbed it uh like in the style of of the archer cartoon okay right and it was just i mean it was dirty it was filthy it was funny um but you you watch it along and i think there's only one season or maybe a season and a half or something like that but there was one see one one episode that they just left the original audio in place, played it. Right. So you're watching this thing or either that or they redub the original script with with the new actors and you're watching it and you're just waiting for it to go off the rails. And it's just literally this cartoon. Right. And it's like watching the Flintstones. What is happening here? It was really, really it was it was more funny because and I just kept watching. I'm like watching this and it's terrible. It's an awful cartoon. It's an awful story. The voice acting is meh. You know, the script is 1980s Hanna-Barbera and it's, it's riveting because, Oh, it's such a contrast to this filthy jokey thing that they've been doing for a year now. Anyway, so similar idea. You take, you know, animation that is eh, whatever, here's something to look at and you, you just play it straight and put a script over it. Yeah. So this show has already been a lot of, hey, you remember that thing from way back when? Let's yeah. do more of that. Because the second topic you had flagged was ancient artifacts from the early internet. Like, what does the fox say? Yeah, I actually went back and rewatched that video. And you know what? It holds up. Like, how old is that? Is that 20 years ago? Uh, It's about 20 years ago, yeah. It has 2.2 .2 billion views that video 2.2 billion and one now because i watched it again the other day and i'm just like this is hilarious here's how well it holds up because there's another item on on this list of things that i, I would have brought up but i'll bring it up now uh the last time we went down in november to visit uh, daughter and granddaughter down in the states uh we introduced tempe our granddaughter to that song, What Does the Fox Say? And she was already a fan from previous versions of the Hamster Dance. Do you remember the Hamster Dance website? I don't think so. Is that the one where the, the hamster is, is basically twerking with... No, that's the gummy bear dance. 
No, it was just, ah, oh, man, the website, you just visit the website. It was very much like some other things that we'll talk about here in a little bit that you just go to the website. It would have a bunch of like patterned animation just happening on it. And then it would just link you off to some other stuff. Um, and then somebody based on that actually did like a studio recorded song called the hamster dance. And we were playing that over and over for her. That that was back in the days before the internet was 100% five different companies with AI generated content. Yeah. When you could actually, you could find something that was someone's passion project and it was probably crap, but mining through the shit, you would eventually find gold. <sighs> back in the good old days. Give me five bees for a quarter, we'd say. When you propose this as a topic, I spent a little time thinking about it today. And two things shocked me. One, just how much shit I thought of. And two, how much of it isn't quite as old as I thought it was. There's a bunch of things that, like, when you dig into it, are much more recent than they feel like they were. Some stuff, yeah. There's a lot of there's been a lot of really rapid change in the last little bit. I wonder how many of the things that just pop into my head almost immediately are on your list. Um and you'll just have to trust me. When you bring them up, I'll say, Yep, that's that's on my my mental list. And so I categorized some some things into some just some loose shit. I did some animations and comics stuff, which we might as well go through now because it's sort of semi related to what we were talking about. The first one I'm going to plug, this goes back to two thousand and three. Badger, badger, badger. Mushroom, mushroom, here comes a snake. And all of the other stuff that goes along with that, like Magical Trevor and uh, um, what was it? Oh, Come to Kenya. I think it was the same, same people who did those ones. Yeah. And again, this, when it was originally out, you could just go to badger, badger, badger.com. It was a website and it would immediately start playing this Flash video. Now, there's people that are badger, probably badger, listening badger, to this badger, that badger, are badger. too young to even remember what <laughs> Flash was. Yes. Flash was like new internet for for the longest time. Um, Macromedia originally eventually got purchased by Adobe. It was a terrible platform, but it did make it easy for independent creators to develop everything from Flash video games. Right. Do you remember playing flash video games, even on like Facebook and stuff? You were playing flash video games that you just unless you build an old machine or run in a VM or something, you just can't play anymore. Like there's an entire catalog, a significant piece of video game history that for all the efforts to do preservation is just lost. Everything by PopCap. Yeah. Which were eventually purchased by EA, I think. Um, but Badger, Badger, Badger is one of those ones that I'm certain was Flash Animation originally. Uh, another one, which is in the vein of things we've already talked about, Happy Tree Friends. Do you remember that? Oh, my God. I hated Happy Tree Friends so much. How could you hate Happy Tree Friends? It actually got a Saturday morning cartoon. That's how popular that was. Um, it, was it? Do you remember Charlie the Friend? Charlie the Friendly Unicorn? That one's that one's really vague in my memory, but I'm I'm pretty sure that they were related somehow. For those of you that don't know Happy Tree Friends, I mean you should check it out. Uh, I think it originally started in like 1999, maybe 2000. Again, they were just small little five ten minute episodes of a show done in in Flash. I think originally, catchiest annoying theme song. Of all oh, yes. time. Imagine something in the animation style of like a My Little Ponies or something like that. Appealing like visually to that type of audience. But then follow the progression of Tom and Jerry. Turn that up to 11. You get things like um, and then Stimpy, Itchy and, Scratchy. And Itchy and Scratchy from The Simpsons. And then turn that up to 11 again. And then you get Happy Tree Friends. It is the yes. goriest most visually vulgar thing you will ever watch in the style of children's TV show aimed at toddlers. It was My Little Pony Pulp Fiction Edition. Yeah. And I loved it. I mean, you don't love it because it's good. You love it just because of how insane it is. It was very much, it was like the, the shock jocks of the 90s, right? Like, I mean, the number of people who listen to those kinds of programs now is very small. And I think if you tried to make Happy Tree Friends today, 
it would not make an impact. Well, and there's just so much of that kind of stuff now that like it's yeah. it'd be a splash in a pond where it was Howard Stern level of shocking at the time. It yeah, stood it was out. new and different. Yeah. I have a question while I'm on the topic of weird animation stuff from the early internet. Why was the dancing baby a thing? Uh, it was because it showed up on Ally McBeal and that gave it an immense amount of exposure. Otherwise, it would have literally just flopped over. Ally McBeal was the number one TV show at the time. And if you recall, back then, there wasn't a whole bunch of streaming services. Uh, satellite was fairly rare. So everyone, like at two o'clock or seven o'clock or whatever it was on a Tuesday, everybody tuned into that show and saw The Dancing Baby and they talked about it incessantly. That's where it started. That's one of the things that I do look back on. Like most of the stuff I I have on this list, I'm like, oh, that's kind of clever. Oh, that's, you know, there's reasons to like it. I look at something like Dancing Baby, which, you know, you would consider one of the early memes, I guess, for the lack of a yep. better descriptive word. Literally just a, an, an animation done in like Character Studio, 3D Studio Max, probably late 90s of a baby just dancing away. Badly. And that was it. Like, oh, okay. It was creepy. Yeah, but not creepy enough to be interesting. Nope. Agreed. Why that of all things even made it onto Ally McBeal and then go viral? Of all the things that were available at that time, that would have been one of the last ones I picked. I think there's probably something to be like it made it onto Ally McBeal because it was safe enough content from the internet that they could put it on broadcast TV at the time. Because if you remember, uh, standards for sex and violence then were a little bit more stringent than they are now. Um, so it was probably like, okay, well, we need to do some kind of a thing about how the internet is terrible and awful and bad and young people, you know, these Gen Xers, they're lazy and useless and whatever. So let's, let's do a thing where we make fun of the internet. And that was a thing that somebody picked out as like, this is creepy. Let's use this. It was probably almost random, to be honest. I mean, someone somewhere probably has a story about it. Mm -hmm. But the only like the only reason I think it became a thing is because it made the crossover from like internet to TV back to internet. But it's not it's definitely not worth the amount of time that we've spent talking about it. No. One more thing in animation and comics, I guess, that I would want to just point out. This is an excuse to talk about H Bomber Guy again. Uh, I know we've talked about web comics uh, a few times on this show. Uh, we've talked Penny Arcade, um, another one that I read a lot at the time the guy got a lot of hate that he didn't deserve uh was control alt delete loss this is one of the the first instances i recall and this is 2008 so it wasn't that far back of somebody that most of the internet would have considered like the internet's own he's one yeah. of us Doing something that people reacted so negatively towards yes. that it it gets memed to this day. It does. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I suggest you look into it. I would suggest looking at the H Bomber Guy video that he did specifically about this. As with all H Bomber Guy videos, the video is about a bigger, more encompassing thing through the lens of of this particular comic. Um, the guy Tim Buckley did. What a lot of people were doing at the time, uh, a comic instead of a podcast about their sort of nerdy hobbies, which were primarily focused on video gaming. Mostly uh, console. And, you know, whatever. It was it was vapid and, and unimportant and it was the kind of thing I'd read three times a week and, and enjoy. But I know he and his real life girlfriend at the time, um, unfortunately, had a miscarriage. And... He dealt with it publicly, which was a massive, it was a massive tonal shift, which I think turned sure. a lot of off. At the same time, if you look at that comic, so he obviously did a, a comic with his, his fictional characters from the comic going through something similar, and it's entirely done visually. It's a four panel storytelling comic, no words. And if you ignore the fact that it is completely wildly out of line with the rest of the content that he's done and that his audience was the audience to react most poorly to it. It is yes. a piece of fucking art. 
It is. It is well done, and I. I this. I, I mean, that got lost in all of that. <sighs> yeah, it, it was like if if it had just been something that you you know it stood on its own without the baggage being attached to this web comic audience and and him and his persona and the characters and all of that shit, and you just examine it for what it is, it is brilliantly done to be able to do what he did without words and just communicate. Emotion. Yeah. yeah. It's an emotional piece for sure. And like my comments to this point have been kind of flippant because it has become a meme and it, and it is a major thing for, uh, for Reddit. Like it's, it's, it Oh yeah. Daily. Like unfortunately, yeah. Reddit 4chan, like something awful back at the time, everybody memed on this thing and people still make memes about this thing. And, and like people recognize the memes, but don't recognize the origin now. Yes. I mean, that's, that's kind of a thing that happens in societies in general, but I, I like, I remember reading that cause I, I read control of delete as well. I, I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Um, I enjoyed the comic. I enjoyed the characters. It was a, a massive shift, but if you, if you were sort of, if you have emotions and you're not a, a basement dwelling neck beard, uh, you know, you sort of follow along with this and go like, like, holy shit, this is, this is something that obviously is having a massive emotional impact on the artist, right? Because it is kind of a mirror that he's holding up to life, mm -hmm. right? To an extent, like the idea that you would reach out and like, I could understand critiquing it along the lines of, like I say, it was a massive tonal shift because you go from, here's a funny comic about, you know, amusing things that happen about video games and people arguing about video games and this particular character being, incredibly irresponsible and immature to suddenly in the midst of this like massively adult emotional holy shit how do you deal with this situation right it's it's jarring for sure but i mean if you're if you're a human being you look at it and go this is something that you should reach out with condolences not but that's not how the internet works right but it's funny because like if that had happened two years later it would have been completely fine to have that weird tonal shift on social media. Yeah. You know, would have posted on Facebook or Twitter at the time or whatever. And just, you have this regular audience that's paying attention to your, your normal shit, but you, you know, in those platforms are, are more, I guess you more naturally can also let your personal life slip through. Even if through those mediums, that's not normally what you're communicating. You're still using it as a platform for your other shit. But you could say, oh, man, I've just been through hell or whatever. And sorry, guys, I'm not going to be posting for a little while. I've got some personal issues, yada, yada. And people would rally towards you. Yeah. And maybe that's what he was hoping for in this. I don't really know. But the reaction was just visceral. It was almost it was very similar to the reaction we got with Gamergate. Right. Which was just so over the top. Um, there's, well, there's an interesting parallel that you say it would be different on social media. There's a, a golfer that I watch on YouTube named Luke Kwan. He was a professional, uh, on the PGA tour of China, which basically folded during COVID. So he's switched over to doing YouTube stuff. Um, and a couple of years ago, he had a really bad car accident. Right. And he, he basically boasted to say like, Hey guys, I I'm, I'm in the hospital. I, I'm, I can't, I, I'm not going to be able, I don't know if I'm ever golfing again. Right. And the response was largely positive. I come here for golf stuff. Don't post your personal shit here. Exactly. Fuck off. So, but there's a balance there, right? Because in the olden days, we were treating those web comics very much like newspaper comics where you don't know the artist, right? The artist is a person who exists outside of the, outside of the content. And a lot of the social media stuff, like what we're doing here now, we are the content. Mm-hmm. You know, so if we were to, to have a, a serious podcast one week where we say, well, I got all this crazy shit to deal with, like we exist as people to the people who listen to us, you know, all 17 of you, we love you guys. Do you remember? And I, and I say, do you remember? Because these things still happen, but I don't see them anymore. The weekly, even daily email chain letters. Uh, a lot of them get caught in my spam filter now. Send this to 12 people and you'll find money in the next three days. Yeah. 
or even the the email scam shit like the the we you know we meme about nigerian prince emails and stuff like that but i mean i get one or two my work email addresses are attached to public domain registrations and stuff so i just i get spammed constantly and i get one or two emails a week sometimes one a day that's like you're a pervert and I've hacked your system and I'm going to post your videos online if you don't send me blah, 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 Bitcoin. And I don't know, once a year or so, like I'll actually reply to them and be like, dude, normally I have to pay people to put that stuff online. Go right ahead. Yeah. Here's a link to my OnlyFans. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you ever get in one of those emails, first of all, they haven't hacked your system. They're just sending you an email to scare you. There's a good chance that a certain percent of the audience has performed things in front of one of their screens that has a camera, that it's a scary enough idea in principle. And, and you I, know, they're just they're, they're I, casting a wide net, wide net. Yeah. Let's find somebody stupid and gullible to and. Obviously, it works because they're still putting the time and effort into doing it. But I, I guess it must. But it is quite ridiculous. I get a lot of ones about. I get I get phone calls on my cell phone about how illegal package has been intercepted at border. This is post Canada. Your illegal internet something something blah blah yeah. blah. Call this number. Give us your credit card number, or you will be arrested. Yeah, I get a lot of. Apparently, the IRS wants to talk to me, even though I'm Canadian. Uh, lots of Amazon.com gift cards. Uh, but, and maybe it just is a matter of email filters in general. But, like, I've got some work email accounts that aren't on platforms that have filters. Intentionally, I, I leave them unfiltered. And I don't get the volume of stuff I would have got back in the early, like, Hotmail and Yahoo Mail kind of days. And with all the scams and shit that are going around now, I look at that stuff as being almost innocent. Like, I almost like, oh, let's go back to those days. I miss yeah. those Nigerian princes that if I just sent them $10,000, they're going to send me back a million. Yeah, I think part of it is, is that, I mean, there's a weird sort of crossover between our generation and the generations younger than us, which is millennials, which you're kind of part of. You're like an ex annual. I'm right? right on. Yeah, I'm right on the borderline. So like millennials and Gen Z who are now coming up to adulthood and then Gen Alpha after that are a lot more savvy about that kind of stuff because they've spent much more of their lives online seeing this shit. Um, but there's a weird thing that's happening. Like, do you remember when like, our parents couldn't figure out how to like set the clock on the VCR. 12 o'clock flashers. Which, you know what? I still don't even buy, I don't have a VCR anymore, but I have some things that you, the clock needs to be set on, you know, in theory, but I never check the time on them. So I just don't bother. So they're, they're flashing 12 o'clock and I don't care. I still have an alarm clock plugged in on my bedside table that the power went out like a year and a half ago and I've never set the time on. Yeah, because I don't use it like my phone is my alarm clock and it's much better because it's like, oh, I don't have to remember to put batteries in this thing so that when the power does flicker overnight and I get up at, you know, oh, shit, I'm late for work. Exactly. Do you remember clocks? I, I do remember clocks. That's not quite I, our list, but no, it's close, though. I mean, do you remember Bakelite phones? Uh, um, but there's but there's this weird thing that's happening where younger generations have spent like much of their time they could, they're very good with phones and tablets and things but other technical things are like they just they they make no impact because they just don't care which is a weird thing where we go from like our parents don't understand computers to you know our kids and now our grandkids not that I have any of those but you do probably some of their friends don't understand this shit either. No, no. We're seeing I, uh, was it Billie Eilish maybe that came out in the past week or so. I've seen a bunch of buzz where like young celebrities now are regretting that they didn't learn how to type on keyboards because they didn't grow up typing on keyboards. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a better way though. I mean, there's so many like repetitive strain injuries from typing. Right. Like I have problems with my hands from having spent so many years typing things. There's got to be a better way. But it seems really, really weird to like, and I know it isn't true regression, right? But like it was, ooh, we saw the future of computers in the home. I mean, typewriters have existed for 7 billion years. Like there was typewriters, then there was God. 
<laughs> he created dinosaurs. Dinosaurs created man. Man destroyed dinosaurs. Typewriters ruled the world. But then some idiot made the electric typewriter. And then we got computers. But it's all the same sort of basic mechanism here of typing. More or less. More or less. But it wasn't something that until home computers were really a thing that the average person used. Somebody who worked a job that required them to type on a typewriter knew how to type. Somebody who worked an early job that required them to use a computer learned how to type. I'm sure those dudes in the 60s and 70s working at IBM, their whole room computers, some of them probably could type on their typewriters so that they had instructions for what they needed to do with their punch cards. Yes. You know, their their braided memory. But then the computer age, especially if the late 90s and into the early aughts, where it's like, Computers in everybody home. Every family's got at least one computer. Now the kids have their own computers and everybody's typing from an extremely young age. And I, I laugh because I was on the, the early end of that. You would have been too. Yep. Like, I, I mean, I was the nerdy kid that had access to computers at a young age, but I was sort of the exception to the rule. My peers didn't all grow up with that. But then the generation after me did, and I look at things like my typing skills compared to somebody that's five or ten years younger than me, and I type pretty well. I mean, even in my old age, I still, with reasonable accuracy, can get like 120 words per minute kind of thing. And then I see some fucking punk that's, you know, now only 38 or 40, <laughs> typing at like 160 words per minute, their fingers just blurring. And I'm like... If I'd have been, you know, five years later, the game, I would have been you. Who would have thought that people born 10 years after that potentially would not have learned even how to not, you know, take a typing class. Like I never got a typing class in school. I didn't have a computer I class did. in high school, but I was using them. I had to use them. You know, part of the job interview process for a lot of jobs was sit down and type like you just. That was the thing that everybody had to do. And I would have never thought that that would have been such a short window of time. Who could have possibly imagined in 2006 that soon people are going to grow up and not spend any time at a proper keyboard anymore? It's, yeah, it's a little bit weird to think that it came out like that. Like, I remember, do you remember when texting on your phone meant pushing number keys? Like T9, and yeah. Yeah, so you'd like you want an M, you it's like number five once, but if you want an N, it's you gotta wait and then hit number five twice. Right? I have a niece who's now I mean, God, she's expecting her third kid, I think. And like I, I remember watching her as a as a young teen texting on her phone, and I'm like, holy shit, she's hitting like sixty or seventy words a minute, one letter at a time with two thumbs. Mm -hmm. Right. And I imagine that that's an absolutely lost skill now. Yeah. So, I, like, these things, everything is coming at us faster, and it's going by faster. And I'm not sure that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. I'm not going to poo-poo on it. You know, I'm not, this, I'm not being an old man about it. What I am is, as an observer, I'm just, I'm shocked that this is where we ended up. You yeah, know, no, agree. Like this, this, this mechanism for high speed communication went from nobody does it, everybody's doing it, and then immediately went back to almost nobody's doing it. There's, there's an amount of that. A lot of the people that I work with, like I don't do a lot of typing anymore because I don't prepare documents. Like if I'm typing something in, if I have to type in a paragraph, that's a lot of typing for me these days. Um, and I, I, I'm probably in the 60 to 70 words a minute if I were to actually try and type. But a lot of my contemporaries are almost hunt and peck. You know, it's like, like we use um, teams at work, right? And you get the little three dot indicator. Someone will send me hello, which frustrates the hell out of me, by the way. If you're going to say hello, type hello, hit a period, hit a space. Type out your question, then send it. Don't hit hello because it takes me out of what I'm doing. And now I got to wait for you to type. And a lot of the people that I work with don't type all that fast. So I have three dots for a while. 
Hey, dude, can I ask you a question? Sure. Basically the same thing I just did. No, hello, dot net. <laughs> that's not a part. That's not a part of gift. It is literally one of those pages. It's no hello dot net. And it is literally a diatribe against don't say hello. Don't do it. It's a, it's a text message. Just send me your question. So getting back to the early days of the internet, uh, I was thinking about things like early memes. And what I realized is that the early stuff, just because there wasn't so much of it, had staying power that the modern stuff doesn't have, especially the stuff that was tied to popular media. Like I think about the memes that came out of movies and stuff, right? You're the man now, dog. You know, a movie would come out, people would pull a couple of lines out of it, and it like people would legit use it for 15 years. A long time. Whether they're using it for interjecting into conversation or, or like riffing off of it in some other medium or something like that, it would be around and have a shelf life. And now, I mean, there's just so many movies that like somebody can meme out of a movie and nobody Nobody else in the world has seen that particular movie. It's like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, like I still bust out. One does not simply walk into Mordor or whatever, right? Like, sure. People said that for 10 years after that movie came out. They probably said a, a, a set line actually in the books. No, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. If, if it was, they were probably repeating it for 60 years between the books and the movies. Well, to say the the uh, the staying power of early memes. Imagine how much time and energy you've spent quoting Monty Python or The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. I mean, Monty Python is from the early '80s, right? Like that's like. But it's one 40 thing. Years now. It's one thing to quote a movie, and then people who have seen that movie get it, right? Mm -hmm. Things like one does not simply walk into Mordor blew up into such a big thing that people who didn't watch the movies get it. Even when they're not showing the meme where you're actually seeing Boromir on screen where it's, it's you know, fucking Futurama characters in a meme or, you know, whatever. They get it. They resonate with the meme more than they resonate with the movie. And it's it's pervasive. Like it just it had an incredibly long shelf life. Yes, it did. I, I would I would say, though, that I think for people who didn't see the movie and don't have that context, it hits different. Oh, yeah. It is a different um, experience of that meme. Oh, sure, sure. But it's very much a, oh, here's this thing I know from the Internet. Yes. You know, and everybody that I know also knows it from the Internet. Yeah. Knowyourmeme.com. Do you remember uh, taking the hobbits to Isengard? No. This very much falls into like the Badger Badger uh, Happy Tree Fens opening theme thing. Somebody making a song that is so fucking horrible and sticky. It's a super earworm. Taking the hobbits to Isengard. The hobbits, the oh. hobbits, the hobbits, the hobbits. Taking the hobbits to Isengard. Anyway, look it up if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's from not too long after... Uh, the movies were out, and I still busted it once every couple of years at least. My kids busted it out once every couple of years at least. Our our one son still quotes it. I'm not sure that he's actually watched the Lord of the Rings movies in full, but I'll tell you that fucking video. <laughs> hobbits, 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 hobbits. All right, well, now I got to go and look it up. I mean, not right now. I'll wait till we're done, but. Um, do you remember Star Wars Kid? Yes, it's Ghislaine, uh from Quebec. Yeah, it basically ruined his life. Which is super unfortunate because you know what? Like what he did, I still do. Like I still I have I, I have a friend who was basically emptying his house of all the stuff he didn't want and he he had these these swords that he bought at or somebody bought at a gas station and gave to him, right? So they're absolute and utter crap. Um but they're swords, right? So when I'm home alone, like I'll bust them out and I'll like swing them around somewhere where I'm not going to bust my TV. No cameras, but I mean, I'm sure that I look more ridiculous than he did. And there's an 80% chance that while doing it, you're making lightsaber sounds with your mouth hole. It's, it's higher than 80%, my friend.
it's it's in the high 100s and the 100s and again one of those things that's that just was too early and everybody made fun of and shit on because that guy could do it now on tiktok and, oh, and make a million dollars yeah you know everybody would love him uh, the other one that I think still had some staying power that I see a few times a year still is random translation lines on the, I think it was 2004, uh, Downfall movie. You know, the the scenes with, with Hitler late in World War II, fucking flipping out, freaking out, and it's always translated with weird shit. Oh, Hitler reacts. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen very many of those, but yes, I'm I'm familiar with the meme. I have not seen the movie. I am familiar with the meme. <laughs> There's a movie called I Am Familiar with the Meme. Uh, there could be. There I don't be. know. There will be. It's the sequel to Idiocracy. Yeah. Most of the gaming related memes, I think, are the ones that everybody knows. Um, I've been playing around with an idea. I don't know if I would do it for, for the pod merch shop that I'm working on totally check it out at nerdingundertheinfluence.com it's not there yet um buy 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 consume but, you know given the popularity of something like all your base are belong to us which if you don't know where that came from the the mega drive sega mega driver genesis version of zero wing just a bad localization bad translation type thing blew up probably on i don't know 4chan at one point everything starts on 4chan or reddit this actually brings up something that I that popped into my brain almost immediately after I wrote this thing down. Do you remember Newgrounds? Yes. Yeah, it was like sort of the host for all of those things. Um, and one of the ones that all your bass was there. I mean, I, I used to listen to that on the daily. I used to chant it, sing it, put it everywhere. I thought I was so cool. Spoiler alert, I was not. <laughs> um, there was another one that was on there. Do you remember there was a song... Uh, it's something, something, Mr. Rogers. How did it, this is the ultimate song of ultimate destiny. And I think the song came first, but there was a flash animation that went with it. And it was like every, you know, Shaquille O'Neal punches Godzilla and then Godzilla punches somebody else. And then like, eventually there's one winner and it's Mr. Rogers. And he's just like covered in blood and the city city's destroyed because you know, Batman and Superman had a fight and then they got into a car and got married. It was, if you <laughs> haven't seen it, it is on YouTube. It is called the ultimate song of ultimate destiny. It is worth a watch. It is funny as heck. I have not watched it. No. Oh, you have to. No. You know what? We could probably just turn the podcast into this. Do you remember this thing from the internet? Cause there's probably enough stuff. It's in one of our stingers. I used to be an adventurer like you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. That was the one that had yeah. staying power for a while. I don't even remember where that came from. Skyrim. Oh, is it? Okay. Yep. I never played. I, I played the original Skyrim. Uh, no, hang on a second. Is that like like Skyrim? Skyrim? Yeah. Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. So we're talking 2011. Oh, my God. That is a long time ago. I almost actually finished Skyrim. Um, I played the original Elder Scrolls or one of the original Elder Scrolls long enough to create a character and then got bored and left. It's like, okay, no, sorry. I, I ran down a road for, I think, 12 or 13 minutes before I went, you know what? This game is boring. Must have been Daggerfall. It probably was. Yeah. Um, but it, it was just like, what? what is, what kind of asshole time sink is this? Was one of the early sort of like huge ambitions for a massive world, early procedural generation. The difference between it and like Morrowind, which is still a lot of empty space, uh, still one of the best games ever made. I wish they could do a game with that depth, but still have all of the quality of life and production value stuff like voice acting and stuff. Now, Baldur's Gate get pretty close, honestly. It's pretty awesome. Oh, speaking of uh, video games and things, I've been playing a little bit of Age of Empires 2. Um, and I fell down the rabbit hole again of going, Hey, what's the most, um, efficient that one can be in doing all of this stuff and looked up some build orders and some, you know, sort of trade-offs between, do you research the loom early? Do you do this? Do you do that? Ah, uh, dude, I don't even want to play with you now. Um, I, I can't do any of it anymore. Don't Starcraft our age of vampires, man. 
Oh, I was always very bad at StarCraft. And it, it, the, the point, and I really need to get to the point is that I looked at, okay, so when should I be hitting feudal age? Oh boy. Nine minutes, huh? Yeah, that, that's not happening. Like I, I, today I, I played a, a game, uh, against a, a skirmish against the computer and I thought, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go as fast as I can, as fast as I am physically able. I'm going to lure boars close to the town hall. I'm going to do all of the stuff with the, the things. Um, I entered feudal age at 18 minutes and 32 seconds. I mean, I still won because it's against a computer at normal and they're pretty easy, but it's like, I'm not, no, not interested. But the, the reason that I bring up age of empires too, cause it's the definitive edition now, um, is that it's, it's a slightly different game. Uh, there are a few more civilizations and a few more things. There's a bunch of quality of life stuff that I think is really good. Um, because it captures the original game really well. It's a great game. And I got to thinking about this. One of the things that I enjoy about Baldur's Gate 3 is the combat set pieces. And I really wish that there was a Baldur's Gate 3 arena style game where it's like, build your party, kit them up, go fight a bunch of bots. That's all you're doing. You're not doing story. It's just jump in, do the combat, you're done. And I'm wondering, like, the new uh, Age of Empires is it's detailed enough. You can zoom in close enough that you could probably do small party combat like that. And I wonder if the engine would support it. I don't know. Because I, don't need, it to, I don't, don't need it to be real pretty. Yeah. I just need some units with some, some custom setups and, and like, change it. I, a civilization might be a better platform for that. But I was thinking about it just along the lines of the graphics that exist there. So they're good enough. Yeah. I linked you a game uh, that popped in. I don't know if it's in our Discord history or not. Fairly recently, anyway. That The basic premise of it was it's like a Baldur's Gate slash Divinity Original Sin in terms of, like, imagine that, but just the combat. Not a lot of story. Very... It is in uh, my wish list. uh, Stolen Realm, I believe. Was it something like that? Yeah. My wish list, which is <laughs> quite big and has a lot of stuff on it that I don't really want anymore. Uh, Do you remember Leroy Jenkins? Oh my God, yes. I still reference that fairly regularly. Uh, Ark Survival is on there too, but man, games are expensive even for early access these days. I swear I added that to my wish list, but I don't, I don't know where it went. Ah, you probably ignored me. I didn't. I had, You're a big jerk. I sent you a response that said <laughs> I've added it to my wish list. And I'm sure that I did. But I am old now, as previously referenced. I may have forgotten. Anyway, you got any more member berries on your list? Yeah, I mean, there's some gaming stuff. You know, the, the can it run crisis years. You remember those? The The PC building... Okay, you've got yourself oh. a gaming PC, but can it run Crisis? Or the opposite yes. thing now, which is the can it run Doom? But you're not talking about computers. You're talking about, oh, well, you know, I got a, I got a camera over here, but can I run Doom on it? You know, I've got a fridge. A fucking Tamagotchi. Can I run Doom on that? There was somebody who ran... There's a, a subreddit called It Runs Doom. Um or something like that. And they, they put Doom on some pretty amazing things. Somebody ran Doom on a doorbell. Like one of the new video doorbells, they ran Doom on it. Uh, I remember somebody running Doom on a 386 that they had embedded in a freezer. And then they, they put it under uh, liquid nitrogen uh, to try and overclock it to some point where it would run it better. And it's just like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. And I love it. You know, seeing as we've cured cancer already, we may as well do this kind of shit, right? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more important than trying to get Doom running on a fucking graphing calculator or something, right? Exactly. Exactly. What do I think about Fondly? You know, we shared so much stuff back in our sort of formative early 2000s days, our land party group. I think about things like, you you kicked my dog as an example of... Which everybody thinks oh. is the Jerky Boys, just because if you're downloading it on Napster or something, it had been misattributed once. It's actually some dude from Mississauga named Travis. Oh, 
I was wondering if it was like Sasha Cohen or some, something. No. Because it seems like the kind of thing he would do. Yeah. No. No, it was some dude. I think he did it while he was in high school. Oh. The early Kripal stuff. You remember Rick Rolling? I know it still happens, but it, like after 25 years, it finally kind of petered out. Um, Rick Rolling became a thing that was almost uh, like it's it's in the uh, the nostalgia bank now. So being Rick Rolled yeah. is no longer a thing like, oh, I get Rick Rolled. It's like, yeah, I get Rick Rolled. Yeah. Uh, my favorite one was when the the prequels were coming out. There was a there's a version and it's on YouTube where it starts off with, "Hey, here's a new preview for the Star Wars uh, prequels," and it starts off with R two D two, and then it it sort of it does the the circle out wipe to never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. And I'm like, this is perfect. Uh, Rick Astley is awesome. Everyone who hates him is a jerk. Here's one that. I don't know. I've just always assumed it's been around forever. Like I, I sort of relate this to like you and I in the two thousands talking about smoots, right? Banana for scale. Banana for scale seems like it's been around forever. And like the earliest real references I could find for it go back to only like 2012. It's been around as long as basically sharing photos has existed. Um, I, I actually still use it at work, mm -hmm. um, not specifically bananas, but there's a lot of times, especially working from home now where, you know, somebody is taking a picture of a piece of equipment and I'm like, I need something for scale. And the, I mean, the typical thing is you take a tape measure, stretch it across, take a photo. Um, but some, it, it doesn't have to be that it could be, you know, like, and it has been at times a banana, which is when you think about it, a ridiculous thing when you're trying to scale something, cause it's like, is it a big banana? Is it a small banana? It's it's useful for telling the difference between a mouse and an elephant. It's not really useful telling the difference between a fox and a coyote. No. It sounds ridiculous to say this. I think it's almost died in popular culture now. Leet speak. Oh, that is definitely dead in popular culture everywhere except my online nicknames. And And it's, yeah. Do you remember how cool, and I put this in quotation marks, it was never cool, but how cool it was in, I don't know, 2001? Yeah. It was cool if you spell it K3W7. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess it kind of lives on in things like using Keck instead of LOL. Right, which is is basically like a um, like a typing exercise meme. Well, that that actually comes from Warcraft, right? Does it? Yeah, because especially in the early days of World of Warcraft, when you would type in public channels and you were of the opposite faction, you didn't share the same language. So when you lolled as uh, as an orc, for instance. And you were playing an Alliance character. You got Keck. I see. Yeah. So was it a consistent translation of garbled letters? Could somebody in theory make a, uh, a Lua add-on to translate the opposing? I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it was quite a substitution cipher. But like Lol was consistently would return Keck every time. However they got from point A to point B, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, if you just looked at that word, I would assume substitution say through, but I don't think it was that simple. But yeah, lead speak was was fucking. God, I remember the Largo character from the Mega Tokyo comic. Did you ever get into that one? Oh, Mega no, Mega Tokyo was something that I think that I I sort of bounced off of. Yeah, I was into it for a little while. Speaking of, of web comics, do you remember Sluggy Freelance? Never really got into it, but I remember it. Uh, well, I had a, I had a, a favorites list when we were working at the call center that was, I need something to do because it's 3 a.m. and I'm falling asleep. And it was literally like open all in tabs. And I just read that one, close it, read that one, close it, read that. Oh, that's a new one. And that was, that was on the list. And it was just, it was always so ridiculous. Um, and there's a few of them that, that still exist that like I go back to from time to time and read the whole thing. Some of them are still going, which is shocking. But 
there you have it. Somewhat related to Leet Speak, but a little bit different. That phase that we went through where we would take what would be abbreviations or acronyms uh, like ROFL and then turn it not only into a word like lol that you would say, but actually add to it like rafflecopter. Lol or skates. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I mean, the rafflecopter one was because of the, the Microsoft text-to-speech thing that would actually make it sound like a helicopter, right? You remember that? If you type in raffle and you, you tell it to repeat a certain number of times, eventually the speech synthesizer got confused and it, was, it, was, it sounded like a chopper, <laughs> which is, you know, bullshit and ridiculous, but funny. Do you remember Crazy Frog? Do you remember having to buy ringtones? <sighs> yeah. Fuck, we're old. <laughs> yes, we are. Do you remember Chuck Norris jokes? Um, Chuck Norris jokes are still awesome. They are, but they almost it's another thing that's kind of I mean, he's mostly disappeared, but that used to be an almost daily thing in the early aughts, maybe mid aughts. Um, probably after you left World of Warcraft, Baron's chat became um, like it was Chuck Norris because it was Chuck Norris jokes at one point. Mm -hmm. It eventually became Keanu Reeves jokes. Yeah. You know, when Keanu inhales, Keanu breathes. I think the Chuck Norris stuff, I think it hit its peak in the Expendables 2 when they actually did a Chuck Norris joke with Chuck Norris in the movie. Yes. And it was it was tasteful. It was actually great. I, I, I sincerely laughed out loud. Is it true you got bit by a cobra? Yes. And after three days of painful agony, the cobra died. Whatever the line was. It was, it was quite funny. Almost exactly that. Yeah, it was. It was well done. Um, it's. It's. I remember there was a, a TV show, some chat show, where he was exposed to. Did you un realize that there's all these Chuck Norris jokes? And he's like, No. Well, let me read you some of them. And of course, they read them to Chuck Norris. He was in his seventies at that point, sixties or seventies, and it was hilarious. Speaking of Chuck Norris, have you ever gone back and watched any of his movies? Not many. I want to say that at some point I went back and watched some like Walker, Texas Ranger, but it's been a long time since I've watched his movies. They're like, I don't even want to say they're bad. It's not that they're bad. It's that they're boring. Yeah. Like Chuck Norris is an action hero is a guy who walks through an office building and occasionally pulls a trigger. Like it's boring. Yeah. Anyway, we enjoyed them as kids. I am sure that they would still be enjoyable if we were still in that state of mind. I guess somewhat related to the lead speak thing. Do you remember Lolcats and like the whole I can has cheeseburger kind of spin off empire that came out of it? Yes. I can has cheeseburger was basically where the the meme generator template thing started, wasn't it? It's got to be one of the earliest examples of something like that being used pretty mainstream, I think. Was it Omer Gerd? Mm -hmm. um, oh, what was the name of the books? Uh, ah, something tales, um, scary something. I don't know. It's not important. <laughs> we're at the point where we're probably cutting some of this stuff out. Oh, I, we, I hope so. I was doing the, the giant bomb video producer blinking white guy meme there. <laughs> Nine hours later. <laughs> Here's some things that I looked at that are surprisingly recent. And by surprisingly recent, I mean like 10 years ago. It feels like they're 100 years ago. Grumpy Cat. Oh, Grumpy Cat just died like a, a few months ago. Yeah, Cindy loves Grumpy Cat. Do you remember the whole fucking the dress thing, like the white, gold, blue, black dress thing? Oh, my God. Yes, that was. That was only brutal. 2015. Like that wasn't that long ago. It feels like 20 years ago. And it was not. Yeah, I, I would have, you know what, if you had asked me, I probably would have pegged that as reasonably recent. But I mean, I, like I look at things as reasonably like 10 years ago is yesterday for me. Yeah. Remember planking? I think that was a craze uh, for about a week, maybe 2009. Yes. It feels like it should have been so 90s, was not. It was the dumbest thing ever because it wasn't really planking. It was just like laying down somewhere. It was just dumb. Yeah. 
Speaking of which, I think maybe I'm going to go lay down somewhere. It's it's getting to be that time of the night. I mean, I'm I'm still not quite over being sick. Um, and I, you're probably, as you listen back to this and, and edit it, you're probably going to go, he started off sounding almost normal. And at the end of it, it's like, man, are you, are you sick? Yes, I'm still sick. Press F to pay respect. <laughs> That's pretty old. Or the cow that says, perhaps. Cake is a lie. Oh, my God. Fuck, we're old. We are. In internet terms, I mean, we're dinosaurs, literally. Oh, I would like to point out um, that you intimated earlier in the episode that um, international business machines may have created God. That's probably going to offend some people. Fuck it if they can't take a joke. <laughs>